Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you to raise the bar on your own performance and to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's episode. Hello, everyone. This is Hugh Ballou again with the Nonprofit Exchange. The T H E Nonprofit Exchange dot org is where you can find all of these episodes, a transcript of each episode, and information about each of the presenters. And the topic of uh, fundraising comes up a lot, and it's it's a, kind of a complex topic, and a lot of people go about it in old ways that don't work as well as we'd hoped they would. So my guest today is Bill Lloyd, and Bill's going to share some of his discoveries and some wisdom with us. So before we go there, Bill, <clears throat> tell people a little bit about who you are and why do you have a passion for doing this work? First of all, Hugh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate today. I am a 33-year veteran of the financial services industry, and I've got the scars to prove it. And uh, my career has evolved over the years from starting the insurance and investment side of things, evolving into financial planning, and then within the realm of financial planning, always had a bent for looking at different tax strategies to see what we could do to help take some of the sting out of the uh, tax bill for people and small businesses. And um, I've been very blessed to be surrounded by a lot of great advisors and um, mentors over my career who brought me along. And eventually, about four years ago, um, there was a small change in the tax code, which opened a door. And it occurred to me that if we harnessed that little change in the tax code and stuck it together with an area near and dear to many of your, um, of many of your clients and watchers, Hugh, in the nonprofit world, out of the charitable giving part of the tax code and trust in estates, that we could do some real, real good, both for retirees as well as for charity. And I've been motivated in this area for many a year. I've been on the uh, planned giving committee at my alma mater for almost 20 years. And my dad was a career Marine who ran Toys for Tots as part of his duty when he was in the DC area. And giving back has been always part of my family and my professional life. And to have the opportunity to stick two things together and maybe uh, help people have a little bit better retirement and help the many good causes that, um, you know, on God's earth, um, that'd be a good thing. So that's a lot of motivation. It is, it is. So <clears throat> we are, um, we come to this place every week just to learn something that we didn't know. And every week I learned a whole lot of stuff and Bill and I've talked a little bit, but I'm, I'm already with my notepad to learn a lot more. So your, your website is charitablepayraise.com charitablepayraise.com. It's an HTTPS site. So how did you come up with that name and, and that positioning in the market? Well, I'm blessed to be working with a gal uh, named Jen Dalton. And we were in our first whiteboard session and I was explaining to her kind of the architecture, if you will, of the, of the concept. And she shared a, a, a sentiment by saying, well, what you're really doing with this, this new method is you're freeing people from the land of W-2. And what we're able to do is help people in retirement generate in the right circumstances, anywhere from 20 to 40% greater after-tax cash flow and help charities simultaneously. And it dawned on us that the charitable pay raise was a pretty good title for what was happening for those folks who go through the method. So a lot of us in the space make a pitch for donations and people say, oh, I wish I could afford it. But this, this especially, so this is for retired people specifically, uh, not before retirement? It actually could work before retirement, but so often individuals really take stock of all their holdings and maybe a couple of years out try and batten down the hatches. And this concept um, in the right circumstances, as I shared, is an alternative to a rollover IRA. And in particular, we, we have sought to work with individuals who happen to own company stock 
um, inside their retirement plans, a 401k, profit sharing, ESOP, all the above work. It can be publicly traded stock or it can be closely held and it still works. And at the end of the day, the greatest variable to determine whether the new method is gonna make a big difference is the amount of appreciation in the stock of that company. The more the appreciation of that company's stock, the better it works. And um, it kind of sets in play some very good um, dominoes that at the very end set up a situation where the, the retiree or soon to be retiree, or in some cases, just the uh, stockholder and the charity come together in a business relationship that has benefits for both. So uh, would a, for a, a lot of our listeners have a 403B, but that, sure. that would be the same same place as a 401k? It would, but I think, Hugh, that what we're looking at right now is an entirely new, possibly a brand new market um, for charity for nonprofits. Because heretofore, most of the time, you know, your C-suite, your people, entrepreneurs, uh, professionals are often the targets and, you know, the potential givers, donors that many of the nonprofits look for. In this instance, the opportunity could be with anybody, but in particular, it's with good, hard work and W-2 folk, especially those who have been with a company for 10, 20, 30, even 40 years and accrued company stock all that time. And we have the opportunity to take advantage of that stock and do something really neat with it by taking it through the charitable pay raise. So give us a, just a snapshot of what the concept looks looks like, and then let's talk about benefits and responsibilities for the nonprofit. Sure. Um, what it looks like, and again, I mentioned the fact that we're focused on the market of hard work and W-2 employees. Well, there's a reason for that. It turns out that there are over 26,000 retirement plans in the United States in which the corporate stock is held inside those retirement plans. So that in and of itself is a market. But then when you overlay baby boomers, and statistically we know that by the year 2030, there are gonna be 78 million baby boomers who will be in retirement. And of those between seven and 9 million of them have company stock in their retirement plans. And we'll have to make a decision about how to handle that. Ask anybody who has ever worked for Enron or Philip Morris or Monsanto about what can be a little bit problematic by having a highly concentrated large position in their company's stock and something internal goes wrong and what it does to their retirement, not good. So from a financial planning standpoint, we wanna diversify that holding. And if we can diversify it and help them get preferential tax treatment on it, those are good things, especially, as I mentioned, if we set up a partnership, if you will, a legal entity between the retiree and the charity such that the charity is going to be receiving revenue every year the rest of the retiree's life, which amounts to a planned gift. And then upon the demise of the retiree and their spouse, they're going to get a major gift a very large final bequest. I'm sure most of your listeners are very familiar with um, charitable remainder unit trust, charitable remainder annuity trust, um, gift annuities, all these structures. We think we've built a better mousetrap. It's better for the retiree and it's better for the charity. The three I just mentioned tend to be depleting assets over time. The longer we live, we take money out of the charitable remainder trust and if we're taking out more than it's earning, then we've got a depleting asset that the charity is going to be left with. In this structure, um, the mechanics are such that it actually accrues over time. So the charity is actually going to end up with more than there was when it started. And they will also be getting, as I mentioned, some revenue every year while uh, the client is alive. So the client... <clears throat> may have heirs that they want to leave in their will. So how sure. does that impact what they're going to leave to their, their family? Well, I hope some of your listeners will visit our website because there are 
a couple of blogs on there. And um, one of them is entitled, If You Don't Like Your Children, Leave Them Your Retirement Plan. Because of all the assets that someone could leave to their heirs, the retirement plan is the worst for a multitude of reasons. But most especially, it got even worse when the SECURE Act was passed because now um, IRA assets, retirement plan assets, must be taken out in the 10 years following the death of the parent. Mm -hmm. There's no longer a stretch. Mm -hmm. And if you have a sizable holding of IRA or 401k money, imagine that money coming out on top of your children's earnings as taxable income to them in their mid-careers, which is when most of them would receive this. So now you've taken them from tax, <laughs> tax bracket A to probably A plus 10 or 20 by kicking them up a bracket or two. So the reason that this is such an effective method is because yes, we're gonna be taking something out that the kids might be getting, but it might be doing sometimes more harm than good from a tax standpoint. And what we can do for those um, there are strategies such as the use of life insurance, where we could carve out a little bit of the extra income that we're providing to the family and instead um, take a little bit of that and get some either single life or second to die life insurance um, to replace the asset that we've given away. And, and we can do it more tax efficiently, efficiently since life insurance is not taxed. Absolutely. Just been through the other side of that, both both pieces of that. So there's, um, you know, you want to support your family and not leave them a liability they don't know is coming. Um, oh, look, I got the money. Well, you lost it by paying tax on everything or tax on everything. So <clears throat> so this is all a benefit of the of the tax laws. And there's nothing nothing sneaky about this. It's all very yeah. straightforward. It sounds like to me. It's, um, it's been, <laughs> remember those scars I mentioned before? Um, uh -huh. We've been through seven different kinds of attorneys who've all had their chance to get in there and smack it around. And um, all for good reason. I've been, I'm blessed to have unbelievably good counsel. And one of my best friends since fifth grade has been my intellectual property attorney. And the nice thing is that when you've got a friend like that, you know you're getting it straight. And he's one of the few people on earth that can say, hey, Bill, just shut your mouth and sign right here. <laughs> and, I, and I do what he says because I know I'm getting it straight. But we've been through intellectual property, trust and estates, FINRA, SEC, um, intellectual property, um, um, uh, content and usage, um, uh, all the language, you know, the terms of use, all that sort of stuff, ERISA, and finally tax. And we went to a very, very good firm, Fisher Broyles, and have achieved a should tax opinion on our structure. Okay, so I was going to ask you about a tax opinion. So you've you've done the due diligence, and you you are a holder of a few licenses for your your profession, and so there's a professional uh, requirement. In your, in your industry, and there's an ethical standard that you have to adhere to, correct? Absolutely. And I'm a, I am, and for many years, have been a 321 fiduciary working with retirement plans and trusts and endowments and things of that nature, and um, wouldn't have it any other way. I, I just asked that for, <clears throat> you know, when, when people listen, oh, that's too good to be true. It's got to be a scam. So I just wanted to be straightforward. And that's... Um, a whole lot of due diligence that you've done just to make sure that you don't get in trouble by getting other people in trouble. And I, that I remember you told me that when we talked, talked up last time. So what are the responsibilities or costs or liabilities that a nonprofit, I'm including religious organizations like churches and synagogues, what they're, they're also nonprofit. What, what are those that do we incur liabilities or costs or responsibilities? I'm glad you asked that because frequently when I first lay out in a technical manner how this works and what's going on, there's always this fear that this is going to absorb a lot of manpower, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and maybe even some money. And the fact of the matter is it doesn't. 
from the nonprofit side, their responsibilities amount to accepting a gift as they would. It's a non-traditional gift because as I mentioned previously, they actually are getting in business from the standpoint of a partnership. And that's where the magic happens is in the operating agreement of the partnership. But the nonprofit, the church, the university, the hospital, whatever it might be, accepts the gift of those LLC units. And then they are given a number of powers and rights in the operating agreement that we took great effort to leaning towards the charity to protect their interest. So that whether it's the IRS or if it's um, you know any legal matter, the interest of the nonprofit is paramount. And we've done that. And from a stand, the standpoint of time and money, what we're looking for is them, the nonprofit obviously needs to do due diligence on us when they start. So we often try and get to the finance person involved in that nonprofit because it's more likely they'll have some familiarity with what we're doing. And then eventually it will end up with a legal eagle affiliated with that, either a board member or a, a law firm that works with that nonprofit to review it. And my tax people have made themselves available to speak to any, um, any leaders, advisors, advisors to the nonprofit pro bono um, to answer any tax questions they might have. We also, as you might imagine, have a lot of materials that we've built over the years to answer questions and to go over the technical facts for that realm. But it starts off by sitting down with the leaders of the nonprofit to explain to them this combination of a planned gift that they're going to receive combined with a major final bequest. On an annual basis, we just asked the nonprofit to come to an annual LLC meeting once a year, and that's mandated. All right, so we just, it's, it's to our advantage to show up at that meeting as well, because you, you learn some things. So in, in, we teach there's eight streams of revenue in, for any nonprofit. One mm -hmm. of them is planned giving, and that's the one we have the least activity with when it ought to be one of the, the one that's in front that we, we value the most. Because who, who of, of, has substance wouldn't want to leave a gift that would create a legacy in their name? or even not in their name, but the, you know, the family knows you've created a program or helped the nonprofit create a legacy. So you Absolutely. said W-2 employees. Now, some people on boards are in our local business people that are um, consultants or coaches or whatever, and they do work uh, for organizations on a 1099 basis, but they still might have a retirement plan. So is it somebody that has a retirement plan? Does it have to be a W-2 employee? I, I, should, I should elaborate just for a minute. The reason that we focused on that particular segment. And that stock held inside retirement plans is known as NUA. And your tax people will be familiar with that. It stands for net unrealized appreciation stock. And we sought them as a market because they've never been taken care of before. And finally, we have an instrument that really benefits them. So that put that in one corner. But this, this method, this system actually works for anyone with a highly appreciated capital asset, whether it's a stock, a piece of land, just regular stock, piece of land or whatever it might be, we can also do it with that. So we don't wanna restrict individuals who don't have new stock. If they have other appreciated assets, they should take a look at this method. And we, our app, which is patent pending, um, analyzes whether it's better to do it the old fashioned way or whether it's better to do it the new way. My, uh, my car would qualify as an appreciated asset during this last year. <laughs> First time in history, golly gee. So um, the crazy. We're looking for appreciated assets. <laughs> well, it, it, well, it did go up, you know, bought it <laughs> price and four years later, it's higher price. It's amazing. So uh, there's a lot of well, this let me, crazy. Let me give you an example of a woman who's part of my team and her husband years ago, were yelling like we all do across the house to, hey, honey, hey, honey. My broker's on the line. He says, there's this new company we should invest in. And she's getting in the shower and she's like, oh, $500, go ahead. And she takes her shower. Well, he invested $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> so 
That did not go over real well at the kitchen table, but it goes over real well now. It was at the very beginning of Apple, and they've held those shares all these years. Oh, my. And they are looking at using this as a means of maximizing the value to them from a, uh, which will generate a lot of tax-free cash flow to them um, even before their retirement years. So your question before, they're in their mid fifties and simultaneously will be helping um, their synagogue and several of the Jewish um, ministries in the Baltimore area. That is brilliant. That is brilliant. I, I remember those days. I remember when Chrysler was a dollar, you know, if we only had a crystal ball. So let me, um, people on the podcast, you can certainly go on the nonprofit exchange and see the visuals. But uh, um, when people go to the charitable pay raise.com, they get to this good looking green website. I like the green color is sort of suggestive. But you were speaking about the blog. I just want to see what people will find the blog. You know, on here, you, you refer to a specific article about if you don't like your children, leave them in your retirement plan. That's right. No, here. Leave, leave them your retirement plan. Leave them because retirement. Of all the yeah. tax implications that are going to come downhill on them fast and furious. <laughs> there's, there's a knowledge bank and then here's where to get started. So there's there's quite a few really good, helpful things. The charitable pay raise dot com. I, th I think the first first thing is to do some due due diligence. Excuse me. The V is not on the um, URL. It's just charitable pay raise dot com. All sorry. One word. sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Forgive no, me. No, no, no. Specificity is critical. I'm a musician. You know, very little <laughs> difference makes makes a big difference. Uh, it's the wrong note. Um, all right. So charitable pay raise dot com. Just like it sounds, no hyphens or periods. So um, getting smart about this. And so we all have in our, our supporters could be a volunteer, a board member, an advisor, or just a general donor supporter. Sure, um, sure. And there are people who would be in this sweet spot and what you, I heard just kind of went by boomers. That's a big number. Boomers are getting out of the workplace. And I'm living and I'm, the dream. <laughs> yeah. I'm at the top end of the, I'm on the front end of the boomers. My wife's in the back end. So we have different, I don't know the word retirement, but I'm, I'm joining what I do, but there is, you know, I do have a fund that could be qualified for this. So how do we begin to have the conversation where we don't really know how to talk about plan giving as a nonprofit leader. So where do we start? And probably if somebody has assets, they have a financial planner. So is that person going to be a block or they need to be in the conversation with you? No, 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 no. And I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you, Hugh, because we're not trying to replace any advisors. As a matter of fact, in our business model, we require that the client's own attorney perform due diligence on us, and they will be the ones writing the documents. When our clients sign an NDA and the user license, we provide them with templates of all the materials, which then the attorneys can modify, they can question for the domicile where that client lives and wants to have this, this partnership with the charity of their choice or donor advised fund or whatever it might be. And um, their financial advisor, um, assuming they've got a good relationship, is going to be managing those assets along with their client inside the LLC. Their CPA is going to be doing the tax work for it. And we require an annual mini audit of this LLC because we want to run it like a business. And if there was ever an audit, we want to have our books and records all in good shape. It's another reason why we mandate that there's an annual meeting every year. Um, you know, the, we're doing it by the book. And no, so we're not replacing any advisors. As a matter of fact, we're working with them. And the other thing is, it's not an all or none solution. So part of our outreach is to financial advisors to teach them how to use this appropriately. Because as you know, once upon a time, a crat or a crut was a new thing. A nim crut was a new thing. And everybody had to learn how to use them properly. Then a donor advised fund. And these are all wonderful tools. And we'd like to believe that we're the next in that evolution of positive new tools that can be really beneficial in the nonprofit environment and create a win-win. Um, the way to get started would be do um, get a hold of us and let's do a test case because um, I think you learn by doing. 
So we can talk about it and you can read on the website and get your feet wet, but then you can also do a, uh, you know, a, um, you know, a template case. If, um, uh, you can do kind of a what if case with us and go through it. Or if you have somebody that you'd like to put through directly, we can do that too. But by going through the process and seeing the numbers, you'll get a much better feel for what this could do to assist the revenue flows to your nonprofit. We might have to abruptly end this call because I got to call my financial planner and get them on the phone with you. Okay. So that's, 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 uh, I was, I'm trying to, to think about what people would think. And, you know, they might think, oh, what's my, what's my team going to think about this? So you should have uh, an, an attorney and a CPA and a financial planner that advises you on everything in the fact that they, they get their hands on all the documents and can write, can write the, uh, the, the other documents that you need. That's very strong, Bill. You've, you've obviously done a lot of um, heavy lifting here, it, and I'm sure very costly as well. So you're getting people into a space where we really need to let go of some of our old bad habits, which aren't, especially in today's market, aren't doing justice what we need to do and look at some new avenues. So we're in a new era. And people want to say, oh, it's the new normal. There's nothing normal. And it's time to do something radical. And if, if we're going to survive and thrive, take advantage of these tax laws that are right there in front of us. So you've opened my eyes to uh, a big, this is a big deal thing, I think. It is. And it can have some ancillary. It doesn't, not every time, but frequently we can, because of the, the mechanics involved, it can lead to some other really, really positive opportunities, such as the ability for the client to do a Roth conversion because of some of the tax deductions and things that happen through the process. In addition, we find that it's a great time for people to get caught up on their traditional estate planning documents that maybe they've left in the drawer for 20 years and uh, need to brush off. And uh, it, it, it's been good all the way around. So. Well, we're, we're talking to Bill Lloyd today. His business is charitablepayraise.com. And um, if you go to the nonprofitexchange.org, that one has a V in it, T-H-E nonprofitexchange.org, you'll find a landing page about this series. And then you click on the archive button and you see um, this one right there. So Bill, you've taken time to educate me and a whole bunch of other people. And I'm grateful for this. I had a little knowledge of this, but it's a whole lot better than I had had remembered. So thank you for spending time with us today. Um, what, what do you want to leave people with? A thought or a tip or concept? What do you want to leave people with? I, I, I really like and believe in our tagline, um, better retirement, lasting legacy. You know, it, the beauty of I'm the good Lord keeps throwing great people in front of me, Hugh, and you're one of them and getting the word out and the needs that I've had, it's been unbelievable. And um, I think that this can be just such a positive arrow in the quiver of charities, nonprofits, advisors, um, CPAs and attorneys um, to help rebuild the, you know, the money that may have not gotten to many a nonprofit through COVID and with what's going on in the markets right now and being able, another way of reaching out to the people of Ukraine, as well as all the Lord's good works. And I'm looking forward to helping facilitate all these different good causes. And um, I really hope this is where we can meet those of you who are out here listening today someday and help you be uh, a benefactor of this new concept. Well, <clears throat> He actually read the laws, took advantage of them, and did the due diligence. Bill, thank you for being our guest on the Nonprofit Exchange today. Thank you for having me. It was great. Thank you for watching the Nonprofit Exchange.